recording has started. Okay, so um, the agenda items are also in chat. I'm posting them now. And uh, the first agenda item is an update on the operator framework recurring with Rob. Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing? So I've got a quick update. Um, so uh, things have been progressing um, well. Uh, well. The three things I want to talk about, um, some new uh, website work that we're working on, um, the CNCF uh, donation status, and then some updates to the capability model. Um, so I'll start with the first one. Um, so we are uh, have purchased some domain names uh, and we'll have, um, we're planning websites for each of the community projects. So the SDK, OLM, and Operator Hub, you know, already has its own website, but filling out some more information about that, as well as an overall wrapper project or homepage um, that has uh, information about things like just what is an operator, what do we think the definition of an operator is, why are these important, who are the types of people that are using operators, that are making operators, all that type of stuff. Um, so those are underway. We're hoping to get that done. Um, hopefully, it doesn't really matter before the CNCF donation, but it's just like then we'll have a web presence when we, you know, unveil this to the world and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I wanted to show off a really quick um, of this. So if you can see you my can see uh, screen here. Awesome. Um, so see. this is a really quick um, uh, in progress kind of dev site for this, but you can see um, operator framework. This is like kind of the main landing page, what's in it, you know, all the different steps that you do to build an operator, what is an operator, things like that. Um, and then we're going to uh, keep working on these what and why pages, um, which are, you know, what is an operator, how do I um, start building one, who's building them, et cetera. Um, and then uh, the what and why will also have this new capability model updates in it. Uh, they're not reflected here yet. And, you know, obviously this text is uh, open for change. And so uh, once this is actually kind of um, in a better state where folks can start adding feedback and if they want to start submitting pull requests for content, uh, we'll send that out to the mailing list. Um, and, you know, it's, it's in uh, Git today, so you can go look at it. It's not a secret, but it'll just be easier for everybody to have focused attention on something that we know is kind of ready for a first pass. Um, so if you have any comments on that, um, ideally wait, but uh, other than that, you can open them on the repo. Um, I'll pause there for questions. Anyone have any immediate um, questions, concerns, feedback? Could you put a link to the Git in chat? Yes, I will do that once I stop sharing or if somebody wants to find it before I get to it. All right. Uh, the next update was around um, the CNCF donation. Um, so there's um, been uh, progress, as always. I feel like I have the same update here. Um, but uh, the main point of contention was around, um, if you haven't heard that there was a project proposed and kind of uh, not necessarily following the guidelines of the CNCF for a CNCF-wide hub. Um, this would be to host all kinds of content like um, Sysdig, uh, or I guess the project is Falco um, configurations and Helm charts and um, operators and other pieces of content that folks want to use to uh, throughout the CNCF ecosystem. Um, and so that uh, the status of that project was kind of delaying some things upstream. Um, and so now that that is a little bit unblocked, um, I think we have a, a pretty smooth path forward there. Um, and so they're going to retool that kind of unified hub effort to go through the proper sandboxing process and all that type of stuff. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're open to collaborating with that if it, as long as it makes sense and, um, you know, we don't lose some of the things that are important to us. Like, um, you know, we do human curation for Operator Hub as part uh, of a holistic process with some automation as well. We think that's important because operators, uh, as they flow through our capability model, it's really important that they adhere to those guidelines and that the, um, the grading that they have is actually accurate. Um, so we would love to be fully automated, but, the, you know, there is a human in the loop right now. We think that's important. Yeah. Now, um, they committed for the other project to be open because it was really bad form that that other project was, quote, unquote, behind closed doors or whatever you want to call it. I commented, other people's commented, that they just, that, you know, that, come on now, we're the CNCF. That's not how we do things. Yeah, so they kind um, so of acknowledge that mistake. Yeah, so it's open now, um, and 
one of the main things that was talked about was just the fact that it was at hub at cncf.io was just like looked like it was more of a vote of confidence or like signal that this thing was more mature than it was or whatever. So they're going to move that off to another test domain. And so we're making all the right tweaks. Um, and the code is now public and the uh, the charter, or whatever you want to call it, is public. Uh, and they're going to spin off a working group to kind of focus on that. So yeah, not the so best roll out of that, um, but it's you know moving in the right direction. What's up? When's your next TOC meeting? Is that later today? Or no? So I think there was one that just happened like 15 minutes ago or something that I wasn't a oh, part okay. of. I think they were talking about that hub issue and, and a few other things. Um, but we're trying to get on the agenda for a vote. We got um, the backing of Dan cool. Cohen, the executive director, um, in a meeting yesterday. So I think we're all smooth sailing there. It's just the, you know, do the actual vote, all those mechanics. Really cool. Which is exciting. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, all right, uh, so I've mentioned um, a few uh, times about this update to the capability model, and I know Daniel was the one that worked through a lot of that, and so I'm going to hand it over to him to walk you through that. Um, a bunch of great updates. I don't think nothing uh, meaningfully changes with the capability model itself, so don't, don't be worried, but um, there's just a bunch of added additional info to help folks think about it. Over to you, Daniel. I think you're muted. You're muted. Sorry for that. Um, so we have heard multiple times that this particular topic of the capability models needs more meat to the bone in terms of what does it actually mean to be level three, four, and five, right? So we've taken a step at that based on some documents that were internally grown um, and have gathered uh, over time. So it's here in the doc section of the operator SDK. Um, and you have the operator capabilities document here so essentially what we've done is we've described what we think um, is the criteria for each um, level. We are actually moving away from phases um, in the diagram. We all, always call these levels now. And we have um, basically provided more insight into what do we mean, what the operator should be doing at this level in the maturity stage. Um, what are examples for operators um, and their um, features at this stage? Um, and uh, what are some guiding questions for you as an operator developer, of course, to be asking yourself, what could my, uh, is my operator level one, what does it need to do in addition to what it's doing today in order to become level three, four, and five, right? So um, won't go through all of this here, um, but um, we really wanted to point out that um, this is something that is obviously open to collaboration, right? That's why it's on GitHub. So we're looking forward to your PRs and issues on this. Um, there's also a mock-up of how this will look like uh, on uh, the framework side. So this will also be uh, consumable in a nice um, visual form on operatorframework.io. And um, this is really not you know, set in stone or us making the rules. This is really about um, creating some aspirations, right? What your operator should ideally be capable of, right? And we see a lot of operators out there that, that are basically just, you know, deploying some of the resources and then they're kind of done, right? Um, and we specifically called this out to be level one and there's a reason why there's, you know, no, no four other levels um, and you should be gradually reaching uh, and growing to reach those um, just to give your operator more features, right? Really make it feel like a hosted service um, or a managed service, or something that provides your workload as a service to a customer. Um, and um, yeah, hopefully this serves as a level of, uh, as a point of inspiration and uh, certainly up to uh, discussions. I think Rob, you had the idea of, for instance, adding um, the uh, ability to emit um, serverless events um, as you know level four, level five, that could be really interesting um, in order to um, make your operator more useful in an environment where Knative is available. So um, your operator would basically trigger Knative based workloads as well based on event that it omits. So these are a couple of ideas uh, and we're looking for more of those. So uh, feel free to raise PRs against this, discuss this in the issues section, um, challenge us on this. Um, but uh, keep in mind, we want to get people to write more mature and more feature-rich operators. Um, and that should hopefully serve as a blueprint on how to do some of that. 
Yeah, and I think one of the things that we've heard pretty loud and clear is that the um, capabilities were they were intentionally supposed to be vague because like not everything applies to your application or whatever. But hopefully this is still um, is less vague, but still as is agnostic to applications as it was intended to be. Um, so you'll see a bunch of sample questions here, and obviously transform that in your mind to you know something that applies to you. But hopefully this fleshes it out a little bit more. Uh, and like Daniel said, we'd love your feedback. I have a question, if that's okay. Do you want to take a second? Sure, go for it, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I, I love this. I, I've been thinking all along these lines for some time, um, but this, these levels seem to be myop, uh, I didn't say myopic, but they, they seem to be isolated maybe to an operator. Uh, and I realize this is about operators, but I, I almost feel like there's a level of maturity that goes outside of operators. So I wonder, is there room for that in this forum or on this particular uh, set of criteria or should this be a separate thing i'm thinking along the lines of like operator to operator interactions or dependency type stuff or uh, things along that lines um, and I, th th there are certain things like the level three i i i guess i i can't imagine even calling something an operator unless it has like level three capabilities the Basic install is just not. I mean, it's it's a seems experimental or a proof of concept, maybe, but not really an operator. I don't. I don't know. Yeah, that's there. I would even say to like anchor it to a baseline of what folks like are used to, at least with the existing Kube ecosystem. Too. Um, you know, just Helm install a chart or something like that, and then yeah, it's just you know, there's no other touching it after that um, kind of thing. Yeah, maybe something, for, uh, maybe this is for a, a different forum or a different, uh, but you, you suggested having some communications on pull requests, but um, it'd be pretty awesome to have maybe a meeting around this. Uh, and talk about that a little bit later. Uh, talk about um, interplay between different operators or just this document? Uh, uh, the, the, yeah, uh, both. But uh, yeah, okay. I was thinking about, uh, I guess I would love to have, um, more participation with those in the know around this particular particular topic and uh, don't always have that other than my own internal team um so okay yeah love to expand that. yeah well um yeah let's either put it on the agenda for next time or if we've got um some free time at the end of this meeting let's talk about it yeah, quickly wanted to provide the additional pointer to the uh, best practice document that we also have in the same GitHub org, but in a different repository for the um, community operators, actually. So we had this on a blog up uh, last week as well. So um, that's where we gather this kind of, you know, general best practice um, level information about development best practices as well as runtime behavioral best practices. So maybe some of that ends up being there. I just wanted to quickly highlight that this exists as well and could also be potentially subject to contributions. Yeah, that's great. Hopefully Thanks. you'll see this moving over to those websites over time so that you know there aren't a bazillion places to go for these things. Um, not that each project will have its own docs, you know, the SDK will have all of its own stuff as well. Um, but we'll try to unify it as much as possible. Hello, uh, my name's David Zager and I've been seeing a lot of questions about like writing idiomatic reconcile functions. And I was wondering if that was something you guys have considered, like what reconcile functions are supposed to look like. Um, I I haven't seen anything to point people to, and it, it seemed, it's a hard question to like answer off, off the cuff. Yeah, let's open it to the group. I was going to say something. I don't know. That, that, that is an, a, a pretty wide conversation um, and probably worth having uh, a document around as well. I, and maybe that's part of what best practices has. I, I'm not sure. But it's so dependent upon the domain of your operator in some in some regard. In some things, there's some easy stuff, right? Like, I don't know, like always deep copy or pulling something from a cache. I mean, I don't, I don't know to what level you're referring to. And um, it also, I think it is language specific. 
um, in, in mm, the approaches, the same concepts apply, but how you would approach it is somewhat language dependent. I don't know. Yeah, the specific questions I've seen have been specific to Go-based operators and builder based projects and those kinds of things. But it it just opened up the question for me, like what would the recommendation be for an idiot? Like what would that even look like? I, I, it seemed like a hard question to answer because it's um, pretty dependent on what you're doing, but figured I should ask. So the question that I would have is um, uh, when we, should we maybe start with the things that we know are non-idiomatic, <laughs> things that you shouldn't do? Um, because I'm wondering if things that you should do is, or that you could do, um, that would be fine is too large of a space, but stuff that we know can cause problems um, seems like a space that we have some knowledge of today. Um, I'm wondering if maybe that helps uh, narrow down what we tell people like not to do. Like these are things that would go poorly if you do them. Um, and then like, I guess the question is like, is anybody asking this in context of like a specific use case that they have and like they wanna know if that's idiomatic versus non-idiomatic? Like, or is this just a open-ended, what does an idiomatic operator look like? The I, I think I've seen it a handful of times in the past week or so, and it's been pretty open-ended. I'm new to writing operators, and I want to write it idiomatically. What does that look like? But I do think you are right that saying, trying to answer that question might be more difficult than just saying, here's the pretty short list of things you shouldn't do. Maybe a different tactic is to like have a curated list of like what we think are good operators at least, and maybe here's like a real implementation that might not be the prettiest thing or the most perfect thing, but at least it's real, like Prometheus operator. Um, I don't know. There's a, there's a lot of them. Yeah, I, th I think some of the struggle might be that uh, the advice you would give is already based on certain assumptions, <laughs> right? Like you should never pull the API, rapidly pull would be a bad idea, which means you're gonna move towards probably a caching mechanism and watch. Um, and then based on that, there's approaches of how you would use those things that are somewhat idiomatic within that space. But, so I don't know how, how, I don't know where the assumptions start, I guess, but yeah. We could probably start with the assumption that people are using control or runtime at least, right? And that the caching mechanism should be um, and everything to do with the cache and how you watch and everything else should be encapsulated in the uh, library functions that we've written. Do you think that's not a safe assumption? I think it's a good one. I, I don't think it captures all of all of those folks uh, potentially, but I think it captures the majority. Um, I think if you use that as the assumption and you document uh, the best practices based on that assumption, that at least gives people a, a place to go look to see like, well, what is controller runtime doing? Uh, and what are the best practices that you get based on that assumption? And so people that, you know, are writing a Python operator, for instance, can at least go and look at control runtime and be like, okay, I need a cache, I need, here's how they've structured their reconciler uh, interface, all of that kind of stuff. So at least we have a starting point to say, you know, if you're using control runtime, here's how it should look from a Go perspective. If not, like go and look at control runtime and, and it has all of the those best practices kind of um, built in. And then we could expand from there if we need to from the controller runtime documentation perspective. The one thing I would say like from a very high level, if you're starting with controller runtime and its existing interfaces, uh, your reconciler should basically like, you're looking at getting the current state of the cluster, you're looking at getting the uh, current state of your CR, and you basically wanna do a diff and apply any changes so that your uh, current cluster state looks like what your CR says it should look like. 
And I realize that's like extremely high level and doesn't help you solve some of the nitty, get, nitty gritty problems. But I think that heads off, like a lot of the times I see questions coming in about, I really wanna like people will say, um, you know, I'm getting a request into my reconciler, but I really wanna get every single event. And we always have to go back and say, well, no, you don't really wanna see every single event. Uh, and here's why, and we link them over to the controller runtime documentation and FAQ about why doing like event-based um, diff, like you, people are like, I wanna get a diff between uh, what my CR used to look like and what it looks like now so that I can know what to change. And we're like, well, no, you don't really wanna do that because you might see, you might not get every single event or um, you, events might be coalesced and that kind of stuff. So, so I think the one thing I would say um, is, you're just looking at current state, new CR state, and applying the, and you, you always wanna make your cluster state look like what your CR said it should look like every single time you reconcile. Yeah, and I, I, I love it. And then, and then, but then as you get into the more of the details, you start getting into what's the difference between a revision versus a generation, uh, and what are you paying attention to, and how do you, yeah, wh wh why is one worth watching versus another? Um, so I, but I love, I love the assumption of controller runtime as, as the guiding assumption. Yeah, I think where I've seen some people struggle is, you know, as Joe's describing, you're basically creating a state machine and implementing it. And there's different ways you can structure that. And some are, um, a better fit for certain goals and certain workloads that you're managing than others. Um, some are more natural uh, to certain programming patterns or not. And there's a lot of different choices you can make there. So I think it would be interesting to see some examples. I like that idea of examples and maybe even back to the meeting idea, if maybe you know, three different projects that felt good about their reconcile functions wanted to just showcase, hey, this is how we structured ours uh, and show them off and do some show and tell and compare, we might learn some interesting things about what works well for people and when. I would love to see that in the form of case study, uh, like articles that we could host. I think to that point, there were some examples for Cube Builder that uh, grew out of date fairly quickly. Um, so there's historical stuff to look at, but it doesn't fully function now. Um, it, there's probably room for a bunch of examples out there that are that are topical. Um, you know, I'm micro focused on a particular interest of a controller that would be really great in, in sdk we have the the samples uh the operator sdk samples the repo the projects there are very small we could definitely improve them like put the tests we have a proposal for that to, to show how to test and all this stuff which is common questions as well and we have the getting started. We made a blog post to try to clarify Jupyter as well. But sometimes I have the feeling that the users, I don't know if they don't find the getting started, do you know? Because the questions, the common questions like that is one, uh, how I wash a resource, you know? In the getting started is there, has an example, but he probably the person didn't follow that. So because this didn't get, you know, how uh, the things works. So I don't know how we can address this, how we can make it easier for them check the basic stuff information. I don't know if it just makes sense. Yeah, totally. And I, I hope that the doc site that Rob was showing at the beginning helps with that in, in terms of a discoverability standpoint. Uh, in my opinion, I think another aspect of it is that like the samples that you're talking about, Camilla, are extremely simple. Um, so like even if people do find that and do kind of start to model their operator based on those samples, they very quickly, if you're writing any, any sort of complex operator, you're very quickly getting to the point where there's some complexities that you're dealing with in your operator that just don't exist in in the samples operators. So it's always it's always kind of difficult. It's like, okay, well, from the SDK developer standpoint, like how much effort do we want to put into a sample operator and how complex can we get it? And then as soon as it gets complex from a sample standpoint, 
Like we're, co we're going down maybe one complexity rabbit hole when there's probably 15 or 20 different other complexities that we're not covering. So how much bang for the buck would we even be getting by making a complex sample? So I, I think the, the ideas of like having community operator developers uh, showcasing their reconcile uh, methods as Michael was kind of suggesting, I think, I think that's a great idea. Like I think as, as the more we can get the community involved in showcasing the way that they've solved the problem and maybe we can start adding links in, in the doc site to uh, well-developed operators. Uh, I know we have like an awesome operators repo. I don't think we've um, kept that up to date really well, uh, but maybe that would be a place that we could revisit and, and see if there's a way that we can make that a little bit more usable rather than, I mean, I think, I think we can show people our samples, but I think we can, at the, in the same breath, we could also say, and if you're looking for more complex use cases that other operator developers are actually working on, like here's a set of operators in the community uh, that, that we think are good examples of more complex reconciliation um, scenarios. I, I agree with you, uh, and I think if we make the samples too complex, it will be hard for who we started, which is the biggest and common case in my point of view. But it, what about we move the getting started for the ASCII HEPO as well, for example? Because it, I think it, who started with that it starts by the quick starting the readme, and they don't have the full information, you know, and maybe make it hard the things. The docs will will probably address this better as well. I agree too. Yeah, I think the plan for the SDK um, documentation is to definitely have that getting started guide part of the quick start um, section that we plan to have. So like the docs will be structured very similar between SDK and OLM, and you will have an introduction section with quick start, and then you will have a section about you know general concepts and topics, and then there will be a how-to section that describes um, very particular use cases uh, of how to go from A to B in a very prescriptive manner. So I think the getting started guide would really fit well in the first section there. Would, could you we uh, archive the getting started HEPO and you move that document for the docs in the HDK. So yeah, I think just that's... for now. The... Until we have the full docs. Having someone uh, objection to that. Really... I'd like us to think that about like I don't think that the problem that's being stated or that was asked is has anything to do with like a quick start guide or or moving that to a different location. I really think that it's about people coming and seeing things and then not knowing exactly what to do next. So once you write the quick start and you create, you know, now my memcache is is deploying three. Uh, pods like um, what what's next like what's I know my problem but I don't know how to go from this place where we were deploying a thing to where I need to manage my my um, my application and I think the problem gets into like how do I write that reconcile loop in such a way that like will be start to bog down into like, okay, like where do I add the next thing that I need to add to this reconcile? Yeah, I think it's kind of like- It's not about going... the quick start. Yeah, no, go ahead, Joe. I, I would just want to, I think we're, we're, I think we're dialing in on to a prop, like we're trying to find a solution to a prop, to a different problem. Um, and I don't know if the solution that we're working on actually solves the larger, um, how do, what's my next step after I start writing an operator? Like, how do I make this good that people will not think this this is bad? I think it's probably mostly what people are asking. And I think the best, and that's where I think like the negative case is probably our best bet right now. Um, Cause I don't think we, um, 
I don't know if writing down a exhaustive list of everything that is that you can do that would be good is going to be possible. Um, I think it'd be better to say, like, make sure you don't do this. Make sure you don't do that. Um, make sure that you um, are outputting, you know, certain information uh, in a certain format. Um, like, I think the conditions is probably something that we can be affirmative about. Like, you should be using conditions. They should look like this. This is the format for the conditions. Here's the, um, you know, we soon will hopefully have a library for doing conditions work. You should be using the libraries for conditions. Those sorts of things, I think, are what people are looking for. And I don't know if the quick start guide being moved around is going to necessarily help folks. Yeah, I'll, I'll Sean, I agree with you. Because it seems like the quick start guide, looking at the operator capability level diagram that we we're talking about before, like the quick start guide covers level one, basically. And I think what we're talking about here is like, all right, I, I figured out level one. Now, how do I go from level one up to level two, three, four, five? And that's the piece that we don't really have any documentation about. And it's hard to write that documentation. Um, so maybe that's what we, maybe we can try to, um, figure out how we can get more docs about how to go from level one to level two and beyond. And maybe it's simpler from that standpoint to say like, okay, getting started guide covers level one. If you want to go to level two, like here's some, you know, here's some operators that are level two that exists in the community. Maybe we do it that way. Or maybe we have a doc that says, and here's the extra things that you can do. And here's how you might do something in your reconcile function that would make your operator level two and so on and so forth up through the different levels. I mean, we should probably. You cut out a bit, uh, Sean. Sorry, my. Uh, uh, so, you know, I was just going to ask Zegger, if, like, that's that's more or less what he's seeing people ask for is like, OK, now that I got my initial thing, like, what do I do next is really what they're asking when they say, how do I run an idiomatic operator? Or if he thinks that there's something more to it than that. I get the feeling that they would I it would be nice to be able to say answering that question is hard here is a, you know here's a link I can give you that gives you resources to like start answering that question for yourself you know links to other reconcile functions from other operators that we deem are good examples like even having a list of things not to do I think are all I think this all sound good, but having that link that you can share and say, oh, you want to know more about writing operators? Here you go, would be be really nice. It, it, it's potentially, this might be the reason why I don't see an operator unless you're level three, because if you're level one, um, you don't even need to reconcile anything. You're just installing something one can assume. Um, so I don't even understand that. T to me, it doesn't make any sense, but um, I wonder, I, I love the, the conversation as a whole. I wonder if there is a need for a list of have you considered, you know, in particular around reconciliation, have you considered these things? And so just the list of links that go off to have you considered X and Y and Z? And um, because you won't be able to capture them all. I, I completely agree with that comment that was made. Um, you know, there's a lot of assumptions that go into them, but um, have you, do you have a need to listen or watch other objects. Do you have? You know, we could go through a list of those things, right? Uh, how often do you send events? Um, do you send events? <laughs> yeah. Although uh, one thing which would be awesome is blogs are awesome in this regard. So if you like have a specific thing that you figured out is a great strategy for handling X, Y feature, whatever. Um, put it up on a blog. That would be awesome to see too. Yeah, but I, I think the part of the problem is the discoverability of that blog. So it seems like Fair. being the kind of the community around operators here, if you write that blog, please let us know about it. And, and maybe we need to find a way that we can highlight those things from this new website that we're adding in our doc somewhere, whatever it is, to make it easier for people to 
basically, as uh, Zager was saying, like, here's the link that has all the links to different blogs, you know, the FAQ, the have you considered page. Maybe we just kind of throw stuff there and have people uh, be able to go through that and find things on their own. But yes, I agree. Um, blogs are good. All right, any other topics folks want to chat about? We've got roughly 20 minutes left. Um, I think Daniel was requesting feedback on a GitHub issue. Yeah, it's actually linked in the agenda. Um, if you look at the agenda, um, there is an issue in the SDK repository um, about a proposal to extend the SDK scaffolding coverage to um, writing cube control plugins um, or CLI um, interfaces for your operator in general that interact with that operator using client Go. Um, so I was just um, looking to bring this up um, with you and um, maybe get some feedback on um, Maybe some of you have actually attempted to do this um, and found there are particular pain points that a scaffolding tool like DSDK could address or uh, that testing could address um, or stuff where you are very generally struggled um, and you would have liked to have the tool of uh, something like DSDK. Um, so this is about shipping a um, control utility with your operator to use instead of kubectl um, or as a plugin of kubectl but um, essentially that as a as a as a front end for your uh, for your users for your human users in particular versus the bare um, api that shifts with your operator just throwing this out here and see if any people have some experience in doing this or some opinion on this I've dropped the link in the chat. Yeah, I'm kind of trying to come up to speed really quickly. I, I, I would just add this comment that uh, it wouldn't, it, to me, it would feel common um, to have uh, new types defined. Um, well, I think QBuilder does it well. Is I'll just put it that way. Um, it'd be common to create types for which you want to have some control at the CLI level. Um, in, so having that as a support request in some ways makes sense. But I'd have to read through it in more detail. I mean, I, I get how the, you know having that as a separate project would be. Uh, challenging, I would think, and it would require duplication um, or, I guess, submodules or something. Um, it puts a burden on the operator developer. Yeah. Um, sorry, can I just uh, clarify? By what you're saying is that it makes sense to have the uh, a a a, Q, a CLI. Um, in the same project as the operator repo to avoid. I think so. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I, I, I think that, uh, you know, if there's a larger grouping of operators, uh, and then within that group or set of operators, there's a subset that would want some kind of a CLI plugin in some way. And in that grouping, it is just a whole lot uh, easier burden on the operator developer if it's in the same repository for sure. And, and I don't know, like, even if he broke it up, uh, I don't, I don't know what the value would be. In all likelihood, uh, all the things that you would version uh, would be, you know, you, you, the life cycle of of said projects would be identical. I can't imagine them not being, but I could be short sighted. I'm not sure. I think in the common case, it would be same life cycle. I mean, it's, it seems like the lifecycle would be tied to the APIs. 
that you're dealing with, right? So sure. you might have your reconciler change a lot and maybe your APIs would change less often, potentially, I don't know. Uh, agreed completely with that, yeah. Hopefully they are. Hopefully you're not changing your API that much. <laughs> Uh, so it could be like like it could be that if you have your v1 API for your operator like that's not going to change really at all and in that case like maybe it is okay to have a separate CLI project that's outside of the operator project and all you have to do is vendor the client set for the v1 API and off you go with client go um, mm. but you know six and one half dozen of the other in my mind uh, yeah would you do that for there. like as soon as you came in with maybe a uh, a webhook, would you have that in a separate project as well? I, I wouldn't think you would. Um, I, I guess, you know, how many of these components do you decide go into a separate repository versus in the same repository? Yeah, that's a good point. You're talking like a CRD conversion webhook? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that because that would be kind of changing at the same rate as your APIs as well. And yeah, my first thought would be that, that would probably just go in the operator repo. So exactly, that, that's where my right. thought was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't mean to challenge it too much. I like what you're thinking. Is I agree, it's completely based on the API. Um, yeah. Let's put it this way: I don't see any reason why not to put it in your project directly, right? Um, I guess the only case would be like if you've got maybe like four or five operators that all have some interactions with each other and you want to have like a single CLI that kind of ties them all together, then of course you're probably, you probably have a separate project at that point. But that seems like a pretty far out use case potentially. Yeah, what a great example. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Uh, somebody's going to want to do it though. <laughs> All right, any other topics for discussion folks want to bring up? Anybody got any operators that they're working on that are cool that they want to just give a quick shout out in 30 seconds about? Uh, not working on an operator per se, but I've got uh, WeaveWorks is going to be working on an operator here soon to donate or contribute to Operator Hub. Sweet. Love it. Is that the flux uh, operator? We flux. That's that's what I'm thinking they're going with first, yeah. I'm hoping they do more than one. Uh, over at Pantheon, we're doing an interesting thing. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so at Pantheon, we're, we built an operator. So we're building a system that uses Kubernetes and our internal orchestration platform. Um, together on the same nodes using container optimized OS from Google. And um, we built a machine operator that provisions GKE nodes uh, outside of a node pool uh, and, in, and then does a lot of things, registers it with our orchestrator, manages these nodes, kind of overall machine management in this mixed workload. So our internal orchestrator orchestrates system D containers on the same nodes as um, Docker images are running for our services that service those um, customer containers. So um, we, we built a machine operator that has a machine and a machine class CRD. And we're, I don't think we're gonna open source this because it's so specific to what we're doing, but it, it's interesting from the perspective that we're managing G Cloud objects and kind of the way a service broker would um, doing all kinds of extra injection of things and COS is read only. So there's a lot of extra work there that the operator does to do overlay mounts on the boxes through, um, executing remote scripts and things. Um, kind of interesting. No, that's super, no, that's interesting. super interesting. I'm curious, I'm curious, have you run into, issues, you run into issues, uh, tracking statuses and linking together different actions and like between things that are happening on the cloud APIs and things that are happening on your box and then your source of truth CI system. How do you kind of weave all that together? So um, we have the operator integrated with the G Cloud API and the Kube API. 
Um, and then um, we actually had to do some modifications to our code because it needs to be able to access more than one Kubernetes cluster at a time, watching things on multiple kube clusters. Um, so, um, which is interesting in itself. The synchronization happens um, when um, we create the box and it gets created in gcloud and then things happen. Um, we constantly check uh, in a polling fashion on the state through the gcloud API because it's not event driven like the Kubernetes API is, right? So, uh, there's definitely some polling that goes on there. But also, because these are being registered to a GKE master, uh, we're able to use the uh, the nodes API for uh, uh, with the operator. So the operator's watching the nodes API, uh, looking for things that are not ready. And if we're not ready, then we investigate further with the gCloud API. Yeah, cool. Did you guys? Base any of this on the cluster API work, or perhaps uh, look at it for inspiration at least. The cluster API work. I'm not sure about that. Ah, um, let me find. I'll drop a quick link in the chat. There's a, a whole cluster API uh, project that um, basically unifies a bunch of different cloud providers and uh, and more recently bare metal providers around one API that has machine CRD. There's a cluster CRD and other related things. Interesting. Uh, yeah, it is, it is interesting. It, it, as you can imagine, there's a lot of problems uh, you have to solve when you're trying to make that sort of API pluggable, where you have different providers all sort of implementing the same APIs, but they've been wrestling with that for know, like a year and a half now, and I've come up with some pretty good stuff. So I'll drop a link in chat in just a moment. Wonderful. We did look into, I know that there are some operators out there that cloud things. Um, so, you know, uh, like kind of as a, a service, not a service broker because it's like VMs and stuff, but um, reconciling cloud state to CRDs, uh, we found that a lot of them had way more than we needed. So that was kind of the thing is like we're, it's a very specific use case, um, but we were unable to leverage what was already out there due to those things being exponentially more complex for managing all your cloud resources, more like a service broker and less like a, a VM manager. So. Yeah, that makes uh, sense. Yeah. But I'd love to see what you have. Um, you know, we already have code. In it's interesting. Um, hopefully if it happens at all systems go in Berlin this year, we'll be presenting on System D and Kubernetes mixed workloads on single container optimized OS VMs. Um, hoping that that conference continues scheduled at, at this time. It's unknown. Hey, Daniel, one question to you. Um, how does your operator get the credentials to talk to uh, GCP? How do you give it the service account? So, um, well, we use Terraform to manage a large portion of our infrastructure. So those are created by Terraform and then imported in through secrets. But um, the interesting piece here is if we had our operator running in the clusters that we're registering the nodes to, those nodes would have access to delete themselves. Or if one of those nodes became compromised, we run customer code on these uh, in the system D containers. Um, we would end up with a situation if they break out, they'd be able to gain access to a service account that could delete the entire platform. Um, so what we have is we have a GKE cluster called our provision cluster. It has one instance of the operator per production GKE cluster with these mixed nodes, and that lives in isolation. So our secrets are isolated in a different project in Google Cloud in a different cluster than these nodes are being registered to, and we're reaching across to get to the GKE clusters that are control clusters for these nodes. Hmm. So a lot so of new you operate on multiple times, and you give it different configuration every for every instance. So that was something we had to figure out: is that um, is the different configurations because we're talking to multiple control clusters from one provision cluster. Right, so we need to be able to have those credentials. Um, and in the end, um, we ended up having to do some work around just like making a utility class that allowed us to instantiate a kube client um, outside of the operator SDK and the runtime um, that allowed us to interact with um, a cluster that wasn't the primary cluster we were interacting with, right? 
Um, so it was, there's a lot of complexity in the code there. Um, I always felt like it would be interesting if we could have N kube clients for one operator to monitor things and like one operator that could manipulate resources on of multiple other clusters, um, which has been somewhat difficult, right, to do with the current operator SDK. Yeah, it, it comes down to like, do you make your life very easy and say an operator instance has the system level configuration and if you want to have multiple different cloud accounts managed by an operator, you install the operator multiple times or you give it that credential every time you use one of its APIs. It's, it's something we are actually debating internally, um, whether or not it's, it's a good and valid pattern to have the same operator installed multiple times in the same cluster or not. Right. And it sounds like your use case would actually advocate for that to be possible because there's no other convenient way to give it some sort of pre-configuration that goes with every request. Very true. So that's in the end, the solution. So we still need to be able to listen for our CRD on the provision cluster and have it provision um, the GKE node and the daemon sets that run on that GKE node um, correctly in the, in the foreign cluster. And for each from like control cluster that these nodes are registering to, we have an instance of the operator. So we actually have each instance of the operator manages one control cluster from the provision cluster with N control clusters and N operators. And then they still need the two sets of credentials because the node CRD gets added to the provision cluster. So we have to monitor for those, but then we have to add the node and register it to um, the, the control cluster which um, we have to wait for it to have the ready state and monitor its state in that cluster. So we're actually watching resources in two different clusters for each instance of this operator, and we're running many instances of it, one for each control cluster. So it's become quite complex. Um, unfortunately, we were shooting for simplicity, of course, in the beginning, and um, kind of hit some roadblocks after we had already committed to the So. Yeah. Yeah, I dropped a link in the chat to a controller runtime issue where somebody's um, requesting kind of related behavior uh, for being able to watch resources in another cluster generally. Um, so it might be interesting to check that out and add your feedback or your use cases uh, over there. Yes, I, I just pulled it up and I also pulled up the cluster dash API. Thanks for talking to me about it. I don't think we've talked with anyone about this at all, actually. So we just kind yeah, of. It's and that's a very active group. Um, they have regular uh, meetings on Zoom and there's a, a Slack channel on the Kubernetes Slack. Um, so yeah, that's a really good group that you could engage with. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Well, uh, I appreciate it. And I'll throw out that if your uh, talk does get canceled or moved to virtual or something with uh, the conference, we'd love to have you have a few minutes here to chat about that. If you wanna, if the same presentation you put together for that, you wanna use for this or something like that, that would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah, we have two, hopefully, for all systems go coming out of Pantheon. One about um, fun with bind mounts and read-only operating systems, um, which is crazy in itself. Um, and then um, the mixed workloads with Kube and SystemD, so um, on, on a single GKE node. So um, hopefully that conference doesn't get canceled. It's my favorite, and I would be very sad. Yeah. Yeah. Well, fingers crossed on that one, and so we'd, we'd love to have that if you want to get uh, added onto the agenda. Um, we can definitely make that happen, or if you want to commit now, I can put it on there. Yeah. Um, uh, it wouldn't be until September, so that's when the conference oh, is. Okay. okay. Hopefully, that's why I'm hopeful it won't be canceled far enough away. Yeah. Uh, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. And your bind mount craziness and read on the <laughs> system bringing me back to my container Linux days from CoreOS, where we did a bunch of really cool stuff and sim linking between uh, user and, and uh, other locations that were not read only so you could blow away the sim links and stuff, it was very cool. Yeah, there's a lot of nuance to being able to do the system D containers on a read only operating system. So, and like being able to add containers because it's read only, you know, uh, Etsy system D system is read only. So we have to do overlay bind mounts for that. And then there's, um, we use run C with system D for OCI compliance. 
uh, for OCI uh, specs and um, and uh, and there's nuance there with how we're bind mounting into our customer. How we like move password D so that they look like the only user inside their container, and we do a lot of custom work there. So I know that's off topic for this call, but yeah, that's the bind. That sounds very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, cool. Thank you guys for talking to me about the machine operator. Sure thing. Yeah, and let us know in September, and we'll uh, we'll follow up then. Yeah, great. I think that brings <laughs> us to the end of the call here, unless anybody has any closing comments. All right. Thank you all for joining. Stay safe out there, and uh, we'll see you next month. Bye, folks. Thank you.